Pat Conway or our Conroy Center. Very happy to entertain all of those. So with that said, let me switch over to our screen share. It's right there. Oh, look, that's me. I'm the one who's not Pat Conroy. <laughs> so, uh, but there was a time actually when Pat Conroy himself was announced, albeit erroneously, to uh, be participating in one of these. And that was actually the last time I presented this talk for the Charleston County Public Library. That was in October of last year when it was announced that Pat himself would be giving the presentation, and not me. We waited very patiently for him to show up, uh, having read about it in the papers. Alas, he did not. But if you are ever looking for Mr. Conroy, you can always find him in the pages of these books. These are the 12 books published under Pat's byline uh, so far, 11 during his lifetime, and then a 12th, The Low Country Heart, after he passed away. There we are. I'm going to minimize the screen here. Bear with me one second. There we are. So I can see what you see. Um, if you're not familiar with all 12 books, I bet you're familiar with a few of them, and you're probably most familiar with the ones that have been made into major motion pictures. Those being Conrack, uh, based on Pat's book, The Water is Watch, came out in 1974. The Great Santini, which was filmed primarily right here in Beaufort, released as a film in 1979, The Lords of Discipline in 1983. And then, of course, The Prince of Tides, uh, released as a film in 1991, also incidentally filmed primarily right here in Beaufort, where our Conroy Center is. Uh, but before Pat was the writer of any of these books, uh, which were turned into films or otherwise, he was first and foremost a reader. And Pat's reading life began the way most people's reading lives begin, uh, by being read to by his mother. Incidentally, that is adorable baby Pat Conroy. She is holding uh, right there. That's Pat's mother. Born Frances uh, Margaret Peak, uh, and born um, in the backwoods, beyond the backwoods, without much access to public education. Uh, Frances Dorothy Peak, excuse me, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, um, raised in rural Alabama in Georgia. Uh, it's entirely possible that Pat's mother, Peg, never graduated high school. He found evidence that she had attended when he was working on his final memoir, Death of Santini but no evidence that she had graduated. And yet she was incredibly well self-educated because she found her way to books and to libraries at a young age. And she introduced Pat to this idea of reading and literature and the power of story at a fairly young age too. When Pat was this age uh, of the photograph in the middle there, five years old, Peggy started reading to him a book that uh, had been really transformational to her it was this book, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, Gone with the Wind. And uh, Pat's mother, who again was born Frances Dorothy Peak, uh, changed her middle name to Margaret uh, and was known as Pegger Peggy her whole life because of this book, because of Margaret Mitchell. Gone with the Wind was published when Peggy was about 11 years old. It's highly unlikely she would have read it at that point, but she probably found her way to it by her late teens. And she read it to Pat when he was five. Incidentally, Gone with the Wind, it's not really age appropriate reading for a five year old. It wasn't in 1950, it isn't today either. But Peg read this book to Pat and to his sister Carol in a really important way, a way, a way that uh, opened up their eyes to what literature was. There was no character in this novel in Gone with the Wind, and there's probably a hundred characters in this book. There's no character in the book that Peggy could not relate to someone in their real lives. So at five years old, Pat was learning that there was a connection between art and life, that the worlds of literature and real lived experiences of every day were not separate from each other. They were interwoven. And that's the way that Peg read this book to Pat. And he learned that very early on. Uh, she also introduced Pat to the idea of libraries and the importance of them, that there was this safe haven, this wonderful place where you could go and find answers to your questions. So this is a quote uh, from Pat recalling his mother's relationships with books and with libraries. This is from my reading life. There was nothing my mother could not bring me from a library. She read so many books that she was famous among the librarians in every town she entered. Since she did not attend college, she looked to librarians as her magic carpet to serious intellectual life. Books contained powerful amulets that could lead to paths of certain wisdom. She was sure that if she could find the right book, 
that would reveal what was necessary for her to become a woman of substance. Books for Peg Conroy and by extension for Pat and his sister and all of his siblings become this sort of gateway into this world uh, of escape from your real lives, but it's also a place where you can go and find inspiration and empowerment and the things that may be missing from your life outside of a book as well. Pat is learning all of these lessons from his mom at a very young age because of, of what books and by extension libraries have meant to her. Uh, there's something else that books and libraries are doing for Peg. They're sort of filling in these gaps in education uh, that she has. Peg uh, is an officer's wife. Pat's father, Colonel Conroy, was one of the most highly decorated Marine fighter pilots of his generation, served with distinction in World War II and Korea and two tours of duty in Vietnam. Uh, so Peg is frequently in the company of other officers' wives, most of whom at that point were college educated. And here's what Pat had to say about that. Again, this is Pat talking about his mother, Peg. She outread a whole generation of officers' wives, but still wilted in embarrassment when asked about her college degree. I was a teenager when I heard mom claim that she had finished her first year at Agnes Scott and she dropped out to marry my father. By the time I graduated from the Citadel, my mother was saying that she had matriculated with honors from Agnes Scott with a degree in English. Her vast reading provided all the armor she needed to camouflage her lack of education. The library could show you everything if you knew where to look. Think about that for a minute. That's a really powerful paragraph. It tells us quite a lot about libraries as, as well as a lot about Peg Conroy. She is able to get the equivalent of a college education by virtue of access to public libraries and public librarians and books. So much so that Peg is able to successfully masquerade as being college educated when in the company of other college educated women. It's phenomenal. It's an amazing thing that libraries and books are able to do in the lives of the Conroys. This is a good example of that. Well, there's Pat in the back of this uh, group photo. We've seen Pat and Peg and Pat's dad, Don Conroy. Let's go ahead and introduce the rest of the clan at this point too. Uh, that's Pat in the back. It's a photo from 1968 uh, taken in Pensacola, Florida. Pat was at that point in his first year of teaching here in Beaufort on Pensacola, right here in Beaufort, Beaufort High School. Next to Pat in that back row in the red is his sister, Carol Ann, the older of the two Conroy sisters. It's sister Kathy in the blue on the other side of them. Also in the back there, brothers Mike and Jim. And then up front in the glasses is brother Tim and uh, brother Tom as well. Of these seven siblings, these seven Conroy siblings, three out of seven of them go on to be published writers, not just Pat. Uh, Peg is having this wonderful reading experience with Pat and with his sister, Carol. Uh, but by the time there are seven kids, it's simply too many for her to, to read with, to have this intimate reading experience with all the time. Uh, but up front there in the glasses, Brother Tim, who I mentioned, is now a published poet as well. And somebody did read to him as a kid, but it wasn't his mother, his big brother, Pat, who passed along um, that good instinct, that good habit of the love of language and literature and books. And after Pat passed away, uh, Tim returned to a dream he'd had as a, as a younger person to be a writer, to be a poet in particular. And he has a wonderful book of poetry out now as well. So now think about that. Three out of seven of these kids go on to become published writers because of uh, lessons that they learn early on about the importance of books and language and the power of story. Here's one more quote from Pat uh, about his mom. Uh, and this is, um, Peggy later in life, obviously. My mother promised that reading would make me smart and I found myself recruited into mom's battle of her own lack of a higher education. She distributed books to me as though they were communion wafers. Mom would point her finger to a wall of books and tell me she was showing me the way out of a shame that was unutterable. It's a powerful statement. It's a powerful lesson for a kid to learn at a young age that books are a way outward and upward, a way to empowerment as well as inspiration. There's this magical quality to books and by extension to libraries. So let's go from Pat at that age to Pat at this age. This is Pat in 1961, which is the year that the Conroy family came here to Beaufort, South Carolina. Pat grew up a military brat uh, and that meant moving around. And in fact, the family had moved 23 times before they came here to Beaufort, 1961, uh, since Pat had been born. And Buford High School would be the 10th school that Pat Conroy went to. He's about to enter the 11th grade, uh, his junior year. So think about that. He's been the new kid 
every single year. He's never been in one school for two years, never in one place long enough to forge lasting friendships, to really be noticed by his teachers, start to figure out what kind of kid and ultimately what kind of man he's going to be. That just hasn't happened for Pat. But all of that happens in Buford, um, because when the Conroys show up here in 61, just before the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the colonel's appointment to the air station here in Buford is for two years. It's important to have a guy like John Conroy here in Buford at that point. So Pat shows up at Buford High knowing he's going to have both his junior year and his senior year there. He's going to be in at one school for two years, the first time in his life. And that's enough time to start to make things happen. Buford High School in the 1960s was very welcoming to military brats and is still to this day because of the strong military presence here in Buford. And Pat finds a really wonderful and welcoming group of students and great group of teachers and things start to happen because of that. Buford High School also was the first public school that Pat Conroy went to. He was being raised Roman Catholic like his dad. He'd been going to private schools, to Catholic schools until this point, until they get to Buford and um, are enrolled in public school for the very first time. So here, Buford, 1961 to 63, during his junior and senior years, Pat Conroy becomes a standout athlete. He is captain and MVP of the basketball team by the time he graduates uh, in his senior year, as he will be, incidentally, at the Citadel, once again, captain and MVP of that team by his senior year. He's a point guard, same position he'll play in college. He is also, are you ready for this? Senior class president, Mr. Congeniality, best all around. He's the making. He is in the National Honor Society. He's playing other sports as well. He's everything you can be at youth of high school in his senior year. This kid who had been shy and awkward and maybe a little bit forgettable anywhere else is finding his footing. He's starting to decide who he's going to be. And he's opening himself up to a world of possibilities that he had shut himself off from before. He's also uh, beginning his literary career at Buford High School. Because of the military presence here in town, Buford High School had this wonderful set of extracurricular activities because military families were coming from all over the country, to some degree all over the world, with very high expectations of what public education would include for their kids here in Buford. And one of those things was a literary magazine. So for his, uh, during his junior year, again, 1961-62, Pat Conroy was published for the very first time in Breaker's Literary Magazine at Buford High School. Um, some fairly angsty teenage boy poetry, not really yet giving a sign of the writer he would become, but it meant so much to Pat to be published at all that his senior year, he joined the editorial staff of Breakers, and that's the photo that we're looking at on screen right now. So at 17 years old, Pat Conroy has decided he's going to be a writer who helps other writers, and that's the whole arc of the rest of his life. He begins right there at Buford High School on the staff of Breakers Literary Magazine. It's also inter interesting to note that of these five student editors that we're looking at on screen here, uh, three out of five of them go on to become invested in the world of literature, in the business of literature, not just Pat Conroy. So at a very young age, he's meeting other kids who have the same kind of dreams and ambitions that he does, who are on the same kind of path that he's on. Next to Pat, there's Julie Zakowski, who goes on to become the librarian at Buford High School, and then eventually the library director for all of Buford County. And in the middle there, another military brat, Stephanie Austin Edwards, who leaves Buford after graduation, goes on to have this remarkable career in film and theater as a costumer and dancer for a period of about 20 years. And then she'll come back to Buford in the 1990s, about the same time Pat Conroy comes back and he's writing beach music. And Stephanie will rekindle her great love of literature. And she's now a published novelist and a writing instructor and uh, leads our uh, twice monthly writers group um, right here in the Conroy Center, or virtually more common, commonly right now. But think about that. Again, here's Pat at 17, he's deciding to be a writer, and he's meeting other kids who also have this great interest in literature and books and are on that same kind of path. And they forge lifelong friendships, Pat and Julie and Stephanie. It's, it's an amazing set of things that happens to Pat at Buford High School. He also meets this great group of teachers Pat Conroy, at this point in his life, at uh, 17, 18 years old, is realizing that he does not have to grow up to be a figure of abuse and intimidation and physicality like his father, that he can make a different set of choices and he become a different kind of man. 
So he's looking for other models of adulthood and other models of masculinity to model himself after. And he finds those in this great group of teachers, Buford High. Uh, there are dozens of them. I'm going to tell you about three, four, maybe. Um, so let's focus on these three right now. This is uh, Bill Duffert we're looking at, who was the high school principal. And he showed Pat Conroy what it meant to be a leader in the community. Because Duffert believed that Buford High School was the heart of Buford. And everybody in town who didn't know about the school and care about it, whether they had a kid there, whether they had ever gone there, didn't matter. He was a figure of great respect here in Buford, and Pat got to see what that looked like. In the middle there is Gene Norris, a guy Pat Conroy wrote quite a bit about. Gene was Pat's junior year English teacher and a lifelong mentor uh, to Pat as well. It was in Gene's classroom that Pat Conroy first started to imagine what it might be like for him, for Pat, to become a teacher as well, which of course ultimately he does. Gene gives him a vision of what a life of service to young people can look like, and Pat takes all of that to heart. On the end there, fascinating woman, that's Ann Head, uh, who was a, a big time novelist living here in Buford at the time, and Gene recruited her to be the first creative writing teacher that Buford High School ever had because of Pat and uh, five or so other students who showed remarkable aptitude with creative writing. But Gene was first and foremost a teacher of literature, not of creative writing. He really wanted to give these kids a chance to learn from a real writer. So he brought in Anne Head. At that point in the, in the early 1960s, Anne was being published in all the major women's magazines of the day. Short stories and serialized novels, something we don't have quite so much of anymore. Uh, four of those novels were also published in book form by Doubleday, same publisher that will eventually publish Pat Conroy. One of them you may be familiar with, Mr. and Mrs. Bojo Jones, which was also made into a TV film starring Desi Arnaz Jr. And it was taught as a sort of cautionary tale of, of teen pregnancy in high school classrooms for well, about 50 years or so. So this is a major writer who is, who is Pat Conroy's uh, first creative writing teacher. And Anne also uh, becomes a mentor to Pat after he graduates high school. Uh, Pat continues to want to be a poet while he's at the Citadel, and he's sending poems back to Anne to critique on his behalf. She's always wonderfully supportive, uh, which is not always that easy to do. Here's an example. This is a poem that Pat wrote at the Citadel, which he always referred to as the most famous poem ever written in the history of the Citadel, just four lines long. The dreams of youth are pleasant dreams of women vintage and the sea. Last night I dreamt I was a dog who found an upperclassman tree. That was published in 1963 in the Citadel's uh, literary magazine, Shaco. Uh, Pat, that was Pat's freshman year, his knob year, as it's called at the Citadel. That's a time to be invisible. That's not a time to draw additional attention to yourself. And Mr. Conroy obviously took a different approach. But by his senior year, once again, he was uh, not only being published in the literary magazine at the Citadel, he was an editor for it. Once again, a writer who wanted to help other writers. That's the kind of stuff he's sending back to Anne Head, and she's got to say, good job, Pat. Keep at it. Becoming quite the writer. So these teachers all sound amazing, right? Because they were, in fact, amazing. Uh, but none of them are librarians. And if you'll remember, that's the subject of this talk. I was born to be in a library. So I share all of these folks with you as a point of contrast uh, to this woman that I now get to talk about. This is Buford High School's librarian in the 1960s, Miss Eileen Hunter. And Pat Conroy said this about Miss Hunter in My Reading Life. Among librarians, I was popular in every town I landed in until I got to Buford, South Carolina. Then Eileen Hunter stormed into my life. Pat has a very different kind of relationship with Miss Hunter than with his other teachers. I've told you about how popular Pat Conway becomes at Buford High School, but he doesn't start out that way. He shows up the same shy, awkward kid he had been everywhere else. And when he was feeling overwhelmed in private schools and Catholic schools, what Pat would do and often did do would be to retreat into the, into the church, to the sanctuary and pray. Now he's in a public school and there is no church, but there is a sanctuary. There is a place that feels holy and safe and predictable, and it's the library because of Pat's good relationship with public libraries, thanks to the wonderful lessons that his mother has taught him. So uh, when Pat is early in his junior year and he has no one to sit with at lunch, he retreats into Mrs. Hunter, Ms. Hunter's library, which you see on screen there from your book photo. Uh, and he starts reading a book, big book, in fact, uh, Victor Hugo's Les Mis. 
And it is while he's reading that book that he encounters Eileen Hunter for the first time. He shares that story in a wonderful essay called simply The Librarian uh, from My Reading Life. And at this point, I want to read a couple passages from that essay to you uh, so you can hear this in Pat's words rather than mine. In the halls of Buford High School, I heard rumors of Miss Hunter. She was famous among both teachers and, and students for her legendary temper and her need for absolute control of her book line, Fiefdom. When I encountered her wrathful gaze, she had served as a librarian for more than 20 years. Her disposition was troll-like and her demeanor combative. She seemed agitated every time a student disturbed the airspace of her private domain. When she spotted me reading Hugo, she reacted as though I'd taken a box of Crayolas to the book of Kells. What on earth are you doing here? She said. I'm reading a book, ma'am, I said. In my high school years, I was polite to the point of being oleogenous. I can see that. Do I look like an idiot or something? Miss Hunter snapped. It's against the rules for a student to use the library during lunchtime. Sorry, ma'am. I didn't know that, I replied. What's that book you're reading? She grabbed it out of my hand and examined it as though it were pornographic contraband. She studied the book, then eyed me with a ferocious scowl. This book's never even been checked out. Are you reading it for the dirty parts? She asked, as though she had cracked the mystery of our strange encounter. I didn't know it had dirty parts, I answered. If it does, I'll toss it with the morning trash. If you find anything dirty, report it directly to me. Hugo's a Frenchman. I don't like his books. Do you know what I hear about this Hugo guy? No, ma'am. His characters, she said, studying the cover of the book. He's depressing. All the folks he writes about are just so, just so miserable. I've got another one of his books. You ought to try that one instead. It's about a football team. Do you like football? Yes, ma'am. Eileen Hunter seemed pleased with my answer and pulled another volume of Victor Hugo from a shelf. Then she handed me a copy of The Hunchback of Notre Dame for my reading pleasure. Though she never demonstrated a shred of affection for me, I heard from other teachers that Miss Hunter thought highly of me and always admired my passion for French literature. For Miss Hunter, I think that the state of Nirvana would be a library cleaned of all readers and all the books shelved and accounted for. As a librarian, she was legendary in all the wrong ways and for all the wrong reasons. When I returned to teach at Buford High after my graduation from the Citadel, I encountered Miss Hunter again, but this time as a teaching colleague. She was as cranky and adversarial as ever and would light into me with her complaints as I would bring four or five novels to check out for my weekly reading. I don't think teachers should be allowed to check books out of the library, she said. Pray tell why, Miss Hunter, I asked. You're just taking a book out of circulation that a student might be reading. She harumphed. She was a world-class harumpher. They're all virgins, I checked. None have ever been checked out before, I told her. How dare you bring up the subject of sex in my library? I only do it to excite you, Miss Hunter, Ben said. Everyone had noticed your incredible sexual attraction to me. It's the talk of the faculty lounge. You repulse me in every fiber of my being, Miss Hunter replied. So you say, I, mean, I said, <clears throat> leaning toward her, but I've read the secrets of your dark, disgust, disgusting heart. I know what you're really after. I'm calling Sheriff Wallace, she said. He'll shackle you like a dog and drag you behind his patrol car. To our next forbidden encounter, Eileen, I didn't give you permission to call me by my Christian name. Eileen, 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 I said as I sailed out to my first period class. So Ms. Hunter is obviously a very different kind of teacher at Buford High School, and Pat has a very different kind of relationship with her as a result. Um, <clears throat> but we learn a couple of things from that passage that may be new information to you. Pat, after he graduates from the Citadel um, in two years, before he goes out to teach on Defusky Island, is first and foremost a teacher right back at Buford High School, the same Buford High School he went to and graduated from himself. He's teaching government and psychology in his first year, and in his second year, he uh, added to that what uh, possibly was the very first African-American studies class taught in any public school in the state of South Carolina several years before the high school was fully integrated, but at a time during a period called freedom of choice when there were African-American students on campus and Pat wanted to do something that honored them in the curriculum. <clears throat> it was after those two years of teaching at Buford High, but he goes out to Defusky Island, 1969, 1970 school year. And that of course is the inspiration for Pat's memoir, The Water is Wide, which was made into the film Conrad. Since we don't have a lot of time to talk about that book, I've got to skip to the end and tell you 
that the results of Pat's uh, remarkable year of teaching on the Fusky Island, giving absolutely everything he could to this group of 18 kids, grades five through eight, is that he was fired by the school district and the school board, uh, simply too progressive for his time. Uh, but Pat decided he needed to do something about that, and he sued the school district for wrongful termination. If you're gonna do something like that, a young teacher in particular, obviously you want the local teacher's organization on your side, and Pat had an opportunity to address that uh, teacher's organization. But you know where they meet? In Miss Hunter's library. Uh, so Pat had to go back to Buford High School one final time in this library and make an impassioned plea for the teacher's organization uh, to support him in his trial for wrongful termination, uh, which they do, but the decision is not unanimous. Uh, several hands go up in protest, teachers who will not support Pat through the trial, a trial he'll ultimately lose, of course. And one of those hands belongs to Eileen Hunter. And uh, that was heartbreaking to Pat in his way, as strange and bizarre as their relationship was. Um, it was still a blow to Pat that she would not support him through the trial. And this is how Pat ends the essay about Miss Hunter in my reading life. I was born to be in a library, and there wasn't a thing she could do to intimidate me or run me out. I think I was as fond of Eileen Hunter as anyone she ever met. And I believe she knew that. I believe she'll, uh, she always knew what was in my heart. A beautiful passage. This photo that we're looking at, incidentally, which we've seen a couple of times now, is a yearbook photo. Uh, this is from Pat's junior year, 1961. And this particular photo is from Jean Norris's yearbook. Pat was executor of Jean's estate. We have several of Jean's items here in the Conroe Center. But we also have Pat's yearbook from the same year. Uh, and I was surprised, perhaps even shocked, to open that one day and discover that Miss Hunter had signed it. Uh, love, Miss Hunter. So as, as um, bizarre as their relationship was and as rough as that ending was, there was at least one moment there early on when Eileen Hunter could write, Love, Miss Hunter, in Pat Conway's yearbook. An interesting discovery to find, certainly. Well, we've mentioned the Citadel a couple of times, and in all honesty, I had not planned to talk about the Citadel when I put together the first version of uh, this talk of I Was Born to Be in a Library. Pat wrote three books about the Citadel. What possibly uh, more could there be to say? But uh, there is more, as it turns out, about libraries in particular. So, uh, and the reason I've uh, decided to add this to the talk is because I was on the Citadel one day with one of Pat's classmates, this guy right here, John Worley. Uh, and there they are much later in life. Once again, a lifelong friendship there. John uh, and Pat both graduated from the Citadel, class of 67. And then John has since gone on to become a really wonderful novelist as well. Five novels and one nonfiction book to his credit. We were on the Citadel campus uh, mapping out sort of prototype for a walking tour of Pat Conroy's Citadel experiences, which John will occasionally lead. And we spent that day with John telling me all about the real Pat Conroy on the real Citadel campus and me thinking about and talking about the fictional version of Pat and the character of Will McLean in Pat's novel, The Words of Discipline, which is set on an equally fictional version of the Citadel campus. And we came to realize how important libraries were to both of those stories, both the real story and the novel that Pat wrote. Here are some examples. Uh, this is Pat describing the real library at the Citadel, the Daniel Library, in Pat's um, memoir, My Losing Season. Each night, I returned to the same desk in the library along the back wall on the first floor. I used it as a gateway. For four years, it was at this desk where I tried to make myself smart during my Citadel years. The library spilled over with more books than I would ever be able to read in three lifetimes. My soul found ease and rest in the companionship of books. The library staff knew me on a first name basis. I felt as comfortable entering the Citadel Library as a whelk entering its shell. Really beautiful writing as well, by the way. But once again, this is Pat back to that familiar, safe, comfortable relationship he had with the libraries, uh, with his mother, with public libraries that meant so much to Peg as well. At this point in Pat's life, uh, when he's uh, on the Citadel campus, and the violence and the hazing and the intimidation of the plebe system is going on. He needs a place to escape from it, probably in the very same way that Peg needed a place to take the kids, Conroy kids, out of the home, away from their father, away from the abuses of their father, and have a safe haven, a space that, that libraries have been to many people uh, for many times as well, that, that wonderful safe space that libraries also provide. That was true for Pat during the Citadel experience also. 
Here's another passage from another book, The Death of Santini. This is Pat returning to that same idea, though. For four years, I would enter the library and find a welcoming world of solitude and books awaiting my inspection. In their mute attentiveness, I heard those same books trying to call out my name as I wandered through their marvelous stacks at my leisure. There at the Daniel Library, I found the college education I was looking for, and I would carry piles of books across the parade ground at night and bring back the books I'd finished reading the next afternoon. The faculty wives began to call me the boy with the books. Two things I want to point out in that passage. First, uh, from the end of the passage, <clears throat> it's so rare to see a student, a cadet on the Citadel campus, in love with reading, in love with books, that Pat actually earns a nickname. He's noticed because of that. He becomes the boy with the books. And the second thing, about halfway down that passage, Pat says that he found his college education at the Daniel Library, not in the Citadel classrooms, but in the library. And that echoes uh, his mother's experience. You know, she was able to get something that felt and seemed like uh, the equivalent of a college education by virtue of her access to books and libraries as well. So here we see that repeating itself in Pat's experiences. Well, there he is, uh, the boy with the books, the real Pat Conroy. But as John Worley and I were on the Citadel campus that day sharing these stories, started to remember how important uh, the library was to this guy, to Will McLean in The Lords of Discipline. <clears throat> In that novel, as you may remember, or in the corresponding film, uh, there's a plot that centers around the fact that this, uh, the story is unfolding during the year that the first African-American cadet, Tom Pierce, is on campus. And he is assigned <clears throat> a liaison, a cadet liaison. That's Will McLean, character loosely based on Pat. Uh, so if Tom gets into any trouble, which he does, he needs a way to communicate this to Will. And Will decides early on that they can't be seen together. That's going to draw unwanted attention to both of them. They need a secret way to communicate. And this is what Will comes up with. You write me a note and place it between pages 308 and 309 of The Decline of the West by Oswald Spengler in the philosophy section of the library. That book hasn't been checked out in the history of the Institute. It seems like a really good plan. And in fact, it is a good plan. Not to spoil too much of the book or the film, uh, but I'll simply tell you that Tom and Will do use this form of communication. Notes are left in the Decline of the West, and over time they're intercepted, and that interception reveals one of the big betrayals of the novel. This is one of uh, several novels of Pat's in which a library is included, and in all the other examples, it's always a personal library that's reflective of the character, but isn't actually essential to the plot of the book. In this case, in words of discipline, the library and this method of communication are absolutely essential to the plot of the book. So as I'm reminding John Worley of this on the Citadel campus that day, uh, we both come to a realization. And that is that in all the time that we've been on this campus and in all the time that we've been in the real Daniel Library, it's never once occurred to either of us to see if the real Daniel Library had a real copy of Decline of the West. So we rush back over to the library, John checks the card catalog, and we are elated to discover that the Daniel Library does in fact have a copy of Decline of the West, 1945, single volume edition. And it was shelved on the first floor, uh, sort of where Pat described his desk having been as a, as a, <clears throat> as a cadet. Although that may be entirely um, coincidental, that library has been remodeled several times. You know, it would have been enough just to find the book on the shelf, just to know that it existed, that it was a real thing. But naturally, we had to open it up and check it for messages as well. <clears throat> and here I'll point out that in the film version of Words of Discipline, the page numbers are not mentioned. But in the novel, they are very specifically mentioned as 308 and 309. When we opened The Decline of the West in the Daniel Library that day, we found two notes uh, somewhere around page 111. This help I'm being hazed. If that was actually a call for help on the part of a cadet, that's a very inefficient way uh, to let somebody know you're in trouble. So that was probably left as a joke. But between pages 308 and 309, exactly as described in the novel, The Words of Discipline, we found a second note that said simply, help me, Will. Think about that for a minute. I mentioned earlier on that Pat Conroy's mother, Peg, had instilled in him this lesson. There's a connection between art and life by virtue of the way that she had read um, Gone with the Wind and other books to Pat by connecting the world of literature and connecting it to the world of life, the real lived experiences. That's happening in this book. It's become a sort of literary pilgrimage site where Pat's readers are writing a note to a fictional character, the fictional Will McLean, because Pat wrote about that method of communication in the novel. It was amazing to discover that day. 
That particular copy of that book with those notes still in it has since been moved to uh, rare books and special collections at the Citadel, although there is another copy of the Client of the West now available. And incidentally, when we found the book on the shelf that day, it had not been checked out in 10 years, um, which also is interesting given the context uh, that Pat describes it in Lords of Discipline. Well, if this were a documentary film, here's, here's where we would do a montage so we can speed up in time a little bit because uh, we've got to skip ahead. After The Water is Wide came out, uh, Pat's teaching memoir in 1972, it's hard to such maybe to imagine now, he was simply too controversial to remain in South Carolina. He had to go elsewhere to write these other wonderful books of the low country. The Great Santini was written uh, primarily in Atlanta, Lords of Discipline written primarily in Rome, the Prince of Tides, or I'm sorry, in Paris, uh, the Prince of Tides written in San Francisco, and Rome. Uh, and when Pat was writing beach music in, in uh, the 1990s, he realized that he needed to be back and physically present in the low country again, this place he had always been writing about, always trying to get back to in his imagination. He needed to be physically present to, to write that book. So he bought what he always referred to as the worst house on Fripp Island. Uh, this is it, 516 Memorial Drive, certainly not the worst house on Fripp Island, a beautiful, beautiful home. Um, Pat got divorced from his second wife not long after uh, buying this house. Originally, it was to be a writer's retreat, but after that divorce, it became his primary residence. And he started uh, thinking about what he wanted for his impending 50th birthday. And what he most wanted were, were books. Uh, and people sent him, friends and family sent him books to fill up the home library in this house. Uh, he found another thing he needed as well, and that was a third wife, soulmate, Sandra King Conroy, who he met not long after this, uh, this point. And after uh, a courtship over distance, uh, they were married and Sandra moved into the Fripp house as well. Now we have two writers, two former teachers, two lovers of books, two library builders sharing this house together. And they amassed quite a personal library, uh, at least 5,000 books in that home, more over time. Pat described that incidentally in the last chapter of my reading life, a chapter called The City, meaning my city of books. And here's a short passage uh, from that essay. In the writing room of my Fripp Island house, there's a chapel of ease with my library rising in terraces and shelves all around. Often at night, I find myself drifting through my library of thousands of books till the lamps of wisdom light up the candelabras of my city of books, the glittering city of words that greets me as I walk through my library. Beautiful passage. Here's a wider shot of that room with Pat's desk in it and his writing room. And you can see the bookshelves along the wall there. Up front, that globe, you can also see in a shot is Pat's MVP, tr MVP uh, trophy from the Citadel from his senior year, the year that becomes an inspiration for the book, My Losing Season. And you can see Pat's desk at the far end of the room there, pushed up against the window, looking out at the tidal marsh. Here's a study up front in the house. Once again, bookshelves everywhere, absolutely everywhere they could go in the house. And these were not just for show. Pat was in the habit of reading about 200 pages a day. That was a goal he set for himself at the um, recommendation of his sophomore year English teacher, uh, Joseph Monty from Gonzaga High School, Washington, DC. Pat and his mother both tried to achieve that goal of reading 200 pages every single day. So these, uh, all these books were not just for show. Pat was incredibly uh, well read. And having a, a home library, uh, it's really a wonderful experience for Pat, given the good experiences he had had in public libraries and the Citadel Library before that. Pat had another really wonderful relationship with libraries, and that's the University of South Carolina uh, Library, Thomas Cooper Library, Rare Books and Special Collections, where Pat decided very late in life that he wanted his papers to go, all of his manuscripts, his letters, his correspondence, uh, his father's scrapbooks, the ARCs, the archives, as Don called them, all ended up at USC, so they would always be available to readers, to researchers. Pat, this guy who said he was born to be in a library, wanted to make sure that some part of him always would be. It's a really wonderful partnership to establish with USC. When Mr. Conroy passed away, March 4th of 2016, we came to realize that he had one other relationship uh, with the libraries in mind, and it has to do with where Pat is buried. There's his headstone right there. Uh, and as you can see, it's become a sort of literary pilgrimage site, very much like that copy of Decline of the West at the Daniel Library. Pat knew that people would want to visit his grave because he had been in the habit of visiting the graves of other writers who were dear to him, Thomas Wolfe, chief among them. Uh, and people tend to leave really interesting things behind at Pat's grave when they visit. You can see a couple of them there in the shot, pens and glasses and writerly things like that, seashells, 
Um, you see the small basketball there in that shot as well, too. So again, it's sort of a literary pilgrim site. Pat knew that people would be coming to see him. So he made very special arrangements as to where he's buried. Here's an aerial view of that. Pat is out in St. Helena Memorial Gardens on St. Helena Island, two sea islands out from Buford. And if you notice that red marker on that map too, <clears throat> that is the St. Helena branch of the Beaufort County Library, a beautiful architecture award-winning library. It means everything to the residents of the Sea Islands out there. Pat is basically buried in the backyard of that library. There's a little chain fence that separates the library property from um, the grave site from the, from the cemetery. And that's it. He's actually that close to a library. Of all the places he could be buried, he's that close to a library. All that property out there, the library included, uh, and the cemetery as well, are all part of Penn Center, which meant quite a lot to Pat as a young person. And that's really the reason he decided to be buried out there, not simply just because of the library, but to be on the grounds of Penn Center. Here's a quick passage from Pat about what Penn meant to him as a young person. <clears throat> It was at Penn that I met Dr. Martin Luther King on a street now named for him. I also met Ralph Abernathy, Andy Young, Jesse Jackson, Julian Bond, and the entire leadership of that fabulous civil rights movement that brought the South kicking and screaming into the 20th century. I watched my whole country change because of meetings that had taken place at Penn Center. I'm living proof that Penn Center can change a white boy's life. You changed me utterly, and I'm forever grateful to you. It's from an acceptance speech Pat gave in 2010 uh, when he was inducted into Penn Center's 1862 circle, sort of honor given for, uh, for social justice. And Pat started making special arrangements that night to be buried uh, in St. Helen Memorial Gardens. It's a historic African-American Baptist cemetery. Pat's a Roman Catholic white guy. So obviously that took quite a lot of special permission. But Pat went out to Penn Center when he was 16, 17 years old, generally taken out there by Gene Norris because that was one of the few places in the country where blacks and whites could safely meet. And as Pat describes in this passage, it became this wonderful safe haven of activity during the civil rights movement. And Pat, in deciding where he wanted to be buried, uh, gave people the chance, and is continuing to give people the chance to learn a little something about Penn Center, because you can't get to Pat's grave without going through the heart of that campus and learning a little bit about Penn's history. And come to think of that as Pat's last act as a teacher, and that's something we honor every year. We, the Conroy Center, honor every year in our annual March 4th event, uh, which we hold out at Penn Center, very close to Pat's grave site. Uh, this past year, 2020, the event sold out. That's not the first time that's happened. It's been a, a wonderful day spent talking about social justice and the environment and literature and storytelling in partnership with Penn Center and also in partnership with Buford High School, same high school that Pat graduated from and later taught at. And that's just one of many programs that we do year round as the teaching component of our nonprofit Pat Conroe Literary Center here in Buford. Uh, the center is also a museum, physical place you can visit in person. And I certainly hope you get the chance if you haven't yet. Here's a photo of Pat's desk, which is actually not far from where I'm seated right now. It's the same desk we saw out on Fripp Island. And it's really wonderful for the family to make that available for display here in the Conroy Center. We also have, as you would imagine, quite a few of Pat's books, certainly not all 8,000, roughly 8,000 that he had when he passed away, but quite a few. And that's the bookcase behind me in that particular photo. Incidentally, those, uh, that multi-volume set that we see in the middle of that shelf, the gray and white volumes, that's the complete works of Victor Hugo, uh, that great passion for, Pat, uh, for French literature that Pat developed in high school. That's real, that continued on. We also teach quite a few classes here in the Conroy Center, or more commonly virtually online now. And here's a good example of that. This is a historic, uh, historic fiction writing workshop that we had at the Conroy Center. And that's Michelle Stone up front in the red there, a fine novelist from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, next to her also up front there uh, is Becky Bruff attending what may very well have been the first workshop she attended uh, through the Conroy Center. Becky has since gone on to publish a novel of historic fiction, uh, in part thanks to the work of, of this workshop, which certainly helps speed along the process. It's a book called Trouble to Water, which is based on uh, uh, the life of Robert Small's first African-American hero of the Civil War, later a U.S. Senator, also from right here in Buford. In the back of that shot, another really wonderful writer, and that's Miho Kinas, a Japanese-born poet who makes her home on Hilton Head now. Miho had such a wonderful time that she has since become an instructor for us. That's Miho, once again, in the back of the photo, teaching uh, Camp Conroy. She's one of our three lead instructors for our annual summer camp for young writers and artists. 
We first held that in 2018, and um, Niho was one of the three instructors for that. We had just uh, nine students that year. The following year, that grew to 30 students, a number so large, we had to switch locations, and we went to Beaufort Middle School, which was Beaufort High School when Pat Conroy was a student and later a teacher. So now our camp is being held on the same campus where Pat himself had been both student and teacher. This year, it was not possible to hold the camp in person, so instead we did it virtually online. Uh, with campers joining in from five states, three different time zones, kids who never would have been able to participate in person. And that too was a wonderful experience for all of us. Uh, we've been doing a lot of programs lately, both in libraries and out of them, and uh, we'll in fact be doing one uh, next Monday for Charleston County Public Library about this book, Our Prince of Scribes, Writers Remember Pat Connery, which is a collection of essays from 67 writers we knew Pat at different points in his life in different ways, but we were all mentored and championed by Pat. Book's gone on to win 14 awards uh, and has been the subject of any number of talks for libraries and friends groups. It's been a really wonderful relationship to keep Pat in libraries as a subject of discussion and inspiration as well. And as I say, I'll be talking about that right back here on Zoom from the Conroy Center uh, for the Charleston County Public Library on Monday at 7 p.m. If you haven't signed up for that and you're interested, uh, you can still register for that Zoom as well. <clears throat> We've also turned that book into a series of ongoing workshops, uh, and we held the fourth of those most recently, August 29th, just a couple of weeks ago, as our first hybrid uh, writing conference, meaning we had people joining us on Zoom, as we are right now, and also with us in person at the Morris Center. And uh, I want to tell you very quickly, as we near the end of our time here, about two instructors who were part of that program. Uh, first, there's Stephanie Austin Edwards, who we saw earlier. She was a Buford High School classmate of Pat's, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, and has since gone on to become a wonderful novelist as well. She's also one of the contributing writers to Our Prince of Scribes. And it's uh, Stephanie's fault, uh, I should say, that we have uh, a wonderful intern here at the Conroy Center. I started out talking about 16, 17-year-old Pat Conroy at Buford High. And I want to close out by talking about a beautiful high school student right now. This is Holland Perryman, also in the shot here with Stephanie. And uh, Stephanie talked me into taking on an intern at a time when I didn't quite think that the Congress Center was ready to do that. But I asked myself a question that I'm sure librarians ask themselves all the time. What would Rupert Giles do? Rupert being uh, Rupert Giles being the library mentor figure from Buffy the Vampire Slayer and a figure of some popularity among librarians. Turns out Mr. Giles and I have a little in common. We both get to mentor a remarkable high school student through an apocalypse. Uh, so for, I'm now in my second year as the embarrassingly proud mentor to young Holland Perryman, who is an exceptional writer. She was one of the finalists for the inaugural Anne Head Literary Prize for Short Fiction at Buford High, named for that writing teacher I mentioned earlier in our conversation tonight, Ann Head, who was Pat's first creative writing teacher at Buford High. Uh, that prize was held for the first time last year, sponsored by Ann's daughter, Nancy Fody, who's become a good friend to us here at the center. Winner was uh, Buford High School senior, Claire Bowden. There were two finalists, both sophomores at the time, Emmett O'Brien and her own Holland Ferryman. Holland has also been a big part of a lot of things here at the center, from our annual March 4th event to our uh, annual Pat Conroy Literary Festival, our Low Country Book Club Convention, our By the River partnership with ETV. She's become just a really wonderful part of all that we do here at the center. She'll be helping me out behind the scenes and occasionally on stage at our upcoming fifth annual Pat Conroy Literary Festival, November 5th through the 8th, held virtually, held online this year. Uh, you can start signing up for those events through our website, for uh, Pat Conroy Literary Center. Pat Conroy Literary Festival has its own website and they both have their own Facebook pages where registration is now open. I see Carly has also posted the link uh, for Monday's event for our Prince of Scribes too. Quickly, uh, let me mention two of the headliners for this year's Literary Festival, both folks from right there in Charleston. Uh, Mary White, who claimed watercolor uh, portrait artist. Uh, and we'll be talking about her newest book, We the People, Portraits of Veterans in America, a fantastic project with a corresponding exhibit that opened there in Charleston. And the New York Times bestselling thriller writer and former special forces officer, uh, Brad Taylor will be with us as well. Again, streamed live virtually so you can watch the festival from your own home. This year's festival is uh, presented in partnership with the Friends of South Carolina Libraries. We'll be holding their virtual conference from right here in Buford uh, um, 
on Friday of Festival Weekend, November 6th. And this gets us to our closing. So this is what I want to share in closing. Uh, thank you all for your time, first and foremost. But when Pat Conroy was around, he used to get uh, thank you letters for his books and fan mail and notes from people saying, you have changed my life. You have saved my life. I became a writer because of you. I became a teacher because of you. Your books showed me that I'm not alone in this world. Uh, really wonderful, uh, powerful messages. I can only imagine what it was like for Pat to receive those letters all the time. And I want to tell you about a piece of fan mail that we got here at the Conroy Center. We get quite a lot uh, because the center means so much to so many people that there be uh, a living legacy to Pat Conroy. There be something tangible that you can visit, you can interact with, whether it's in person or online. We get a lot of really wonderful notes. But in October of 16, we got a particularly strange and wonderful note. Uh, strange and wonderful because it was a note from Pat Conroy and not from old man Pat Conroy, who was my friend and mentor. In October of 16, we got a letter from 23-year-old Pat Conroy. Made all the stranger because Pat, of course, had died in March of 2016. So it was a letter from beyond the grave in some ways. And here uh, is what happened. It was a letter that Pat wrote in 1968 to that high school principal I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Bill Dufford, who incidentally is still around, 93 years old, still actively involved in teaching in his way, in his hometown in Newberry. Uh, and it was a letter that was found in Dr. Dufford's archive that he had gone unseen since written in 1968. Pat, uh, if you will remember, in 1968 was a first year teacher and he wanted to write a letter of thanks, of gratitude to Bill Dufford, to one of the men who inspired him to become a teacher. And that letter was very much about that moment, about being a first year teacher in 68. But when we found it in October of 16, that was shared with us, that was also a moment when we were about to announce that the Conroy Center uh, would be open to the public, that what began as the Pat Conroy at 70 Festival would continue as our annual Pat Conroy Literary Festival, and about to announce that I was leaving the University of South Carolina Press, where I was director, to become the first director of the Conroy Center. And somehow this letter, written in 1968, seemed to be about all of that as well. I want to read to you the last paragraph, and then I'll happily open the floor for your questions. So this is Pat, 23 years old, writing to his teacher, his mentor, his friend, Dr. Bill Dufford. I've never understood the dynamics of hero worship. Maybe it was the discovery of the father I never had as a youth and finally found in you. Father who was not only stern, but tender. The father of both the storm and the sun. It was important for you to know this effect you have had. And I believe you know it. But in the shortness and horrible brevity of life, I want to get everything said. Everything. Someday, I will exert the same influence over someone. And I want him to tell me. This is immortality. For what I have learned from you, I will pass on, and it will be passed on, and it will be passed on, and passed on. Powerful, poignant message, and felt like one from beyond the grave when we found it. That last sentence, uh, that really is the mission statement of the Pat Conroy Literary Center, written by 23-year-old Pat Conroy. That's what we've been doing uh, here in our Zoom room and out there in Facebook land for this past hour. I've taken the lessons that Pat learned and inherited from his teachers and shared with his students and his readers. And I've shared them with all of you in the hopes that you'll take charge of them and see that they're passed on and passed on and passed on. It's a real honor for me to get to do that every day, uh, inspired as I am by Pat Conroy, who is my friend and my teacher in every meaningful sense of that word. So thank you all so much for joining us for, I was born to be in a library, I'm going to end my screen share here so I can go back, seeing all of you out there in Zoom land. And at this point, I think you can uh, turn on your microphones. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Silent applause out there in Zoom yes. land. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. That was that was really great and, and beautiful. As a librarian, we always love to hear that stuff, right? <laughs> no, um, nothing were essential to Pat. I don't think he would have become the person or the writer or the teacher he was without the good influence of libraries. Think about the things you can remove from the puzzle and arrive at with the same picture. You can't remove libraries and still end up with Pat Conroy. You just can't. They were essential. Well said. I was going to say no questions came in during the chat. So uh, anyone would like to unmute themselves and ask a question, you are more than welcome to. Aileen Alexander, how are you? Hi. One of my own teachers has joined us out there in Zoom land. It, it, 
I'm really glad I got to do this because I haven't had a chance to come down to the center. And so this was really a treat. Oh, thank you. And thanks so much for being here. I hope you get to see it in person one day. I'd love to see I, it here. With you. It's, it's on my list. I just, <laughs> I just haven't broken away and done it yet. Jonathan? Yes. I have reservations to be in Beaufort the last weekend of the month. And Donna Armour has promised me a tour of the center. So I am so excited that I got to hear you explain all of this. Oh, thank you, Donna. You're in for a treat. Uh, Donna yes. Armour is uh, one of our fantastic volunteers and donors here at the Conroy Center and also the author of a newly published first book, yes. I read it. Solo in Salento, really beautiful travel memoir. Yes. We graduated from the same college, uh, years <laughs> apart, mm -hmm. and a fellow, a, a mutual friend, got us together. <laughs> and now we've got this planned. And so That's I'm. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to enjoy your visit to Buford, and, and Donna's always a treat. I think I saw a couple of questions in chat. Let me see if I can get to where I can see that. Oh, hey, Marlena. Marlena White, uh, incidentally, who is the, um, what are you, the chair, the president, the grand poobah of Fossil Friends of South Carolina Libraries, who's out there in Zoom land with us, has asked me, uh, which of Pat's books is your favorite? I'm going to answer your question, but I'm also going to uh, uh, take a, a bit of editorial control and reword it ever so slightly. There was a really wonderful question that was once asked of Pat Conroy at a time uh, when he wasn't perhaps expecting it. And it was, which book is closest to your heart? I like that wording very much. And Pat incidentally answered entirely off the cuff in that moment that it was The Water is Wide uh, that was the book of his closest to his heart because in his years, that was the magic year he became the man he was meant to be. I love that phrase. Um, and I think about that a lot. That was a year of teaching, incidentally, not of writing. So in the moment that Pat answered that question, he was still thinking of himself first and foremost as a teacher. The book of Pat's that is closest to my heart is one I've mentioned quite a few times in this presentation. It's uh, this little book, My Reading Life, uh, in part because this, is what remind, this book reminds me so much of what it was like to talk to Pat, to know him as a friend, as, a, as, you know, as someone being mentored by Pat Conrad, because this is what we talk about. This is a book that is structured the, around the idea of Pat uh, sharing stories about his own favorite books and favorite writers, but he can't just tell you about those without also telling you about the people and places in which he was introduced to those books. And as a result, it all feels very personal, very conversational, and uh, Pat actually narrated the audio edition of this book. You can listen to the whole thing in his voice, which is a, a remarkable experience. When I do it, I talk back to it like he's in the room because um, it feels that way. It feels very, very personal to me that way. Thanks for asking that. Here. Did we cover all of our questions, Gary? Anybody else got one? All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Again, we get to do a, a different talk Monday night. If you haven't registered for that yet and you're interested in signing up to hear me tell some stories about Pat Conroy's lifelong mentor, as shared by some of the six to seven writers who are in uh, our Prince of Scribes, uh, this is still your chance to do that. So we'll be doing that Monday night, 7 p.m., same Zoom room. And thank you again, Carly, for the opportunity Yes, tonight. thank really you. I was gonna say thank you again. Um, thank you so much for doing this. I know we've had some in-person programs and so it's great to see you virtually and be able to do this. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you Monday night. All right. See y'all then. Yeah, have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I really